Hello, um, thank you very much for inviting me and for the lovely welcome. And let's see if I can make the face ID go on my iPad. Yes, um, I, uh, we are very fortunate, or, or I should say I am very fortunate in a way to be giving this talk on today, the 9th of February, as uh, this week, the 8th of February, is the 143rd birthday of Franz Marc, who um, you probably know was born here in uh, München and lived most of his life here. And of course, there are many uh, exemplars of his work at the Lembach House, at the Pinanothek de Moderne, and uh, of course, around Germany. But this is sort of uh, ground central for Franz Marc studies, so I've been in München many times myself, and it's my favorite city. So, um, the dramatic title of my talk comes from, it's generated by my overarching research question, but it was prompted by two sort of current events. So one of the images I'm going to be discussing a lot is very, very contemporary art, and also a sort of contemporary minor incident that occurred at our own research center, just so you don't think that we at the greenhouse and at the uh, animals mediating <coughs> real and imaginary are absolved from self-reflection or self-criticism. Um, animals mediating the real and imaginary was formed in 2018 around a conference called Horses Moving, which uh, engendered the participation of a very interdisciplinary groups, some equestrians, some people who did equine therapy, uh, a few art historians who looked at images of horses from the sort of modern world and postmodernism, and the archaeologists themselves. But by and large, the group just five years ago as we wor worked on our, our presentations and publication, uh, I would say that almost all of us would consider ourselves to be animal welfare activists. In other words, we were concerned with the well-being and care and cooperative living with horses as domestic animals who we look after. So therefore, in this group, you would not be surprised to learn the group did not include people who uh, slaughtered and ate horses, uh, people who were in favor of legislating on behalf of horse racing, people who harvested uh, mare urine to make uh, synthetic hormones with. This was a group who was by and large concerned with the well-being of horses. Does that sort of make sense with your understanding of animal welfare? So I had noticed a sort of drift in the past few years um, to a, a very concerted move away from the sort of welfare of animals that had been sort of the foundational um, motivation of animal studies. And I know we like to think of ourselves as being somewhat objective as, as scholars, but in fact, probably all of you here now are, are here involved with the Rachel Carson Center because you're concerned with the environment, right? You're concerned with the Umwelt and the, the future of, of the planet and, and what we will leave behind. And it's sort of the same, been the same way in animal studies. And of course, it's the same in art history. I mean, art historians don't go into art history thinking, I hate art. I don't want people to look at paintings and cultures anymore. So, I mean, I, I think we can say that while well, we try to present objective material results of our research, we are motivated by a love of our subject. And when our subject is living things, we perhaps even feel even more strongly about them. So to get back to what sort of motivated me to connect uh, art and animal studies in what I am dramatically calling evil, was sort of the recent incursion 
in a very big way, which there hasn't been very much of a public backlash against, or even an academic one, even sort of under the breath mutterings, about the sort of new ideas that have been introduced by um, some very large and reputable names, uh, nominally reputable, Michael Pollan, Temple Grandin, even Peter Singer have uh, had much discussed concepts around the sacrificial role of animals as, as in the sort of humane sacrifice and dispatching of animals for food. Uh, I mean, I think from my perspective, someone like Temple Grandin who designs uh, mechanical apparatus for killing animals and whose proposed solution to slaughterhouse abuse is having glass slaughterhouses is, is absolutely representative of what I mean by uh, the inversion of, of evil. I mean, if you are for animal welfare, it seems paradigmatic that you have to be against industrial farming and food production. And, and again, like there's, I'm not casting aspersions on anyone who might feel differently. I, I'm open to hearing um, other viewpoints. There have been some studies lately that, for example, indicate that free-range chicken farming is in fact very uh, uh, grotesque and brutal and, and difficult on the chickens. I, I would propose that any type of farming of chickens to be killed and eaten and have their eggs taken away from them is, is brutal and wrong, but, but that's me. Um, so in thinking about this, I uh, was particularly triggered, as, we, as, as the kids say these days, by the introduction of uh, a researcher to uh, our animals mediating uh, the real and imaginary group, who is uh, a hunter and who is uh, raising a pig to, to slaughter and, and eat. So this has been met with consternation by, by myself, very, very vocally. Uh, Norway is sort of a culture of consensus, so it's not really uh, common or easy the way that it is here in, in München to have open conflict and, and arguments. Like no one is going to lean out their window and yell at you for walking down the street with your hair wet, let, let alone con confront you about your, your academic practice and, 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 and your lifestyle. So in thinking about this, uh, this has become also a sort of a trend uh, in not in academia, but in just sort of general life that you have people who say, well, my meat is raised humanely. I've known this sheep or this pig or this cow all his or her life, and he or she has had a, a good life, and he'll have a, a good death. <coughs> that as if the animal somehow wants to be sacrificed um, and, and consumed. And from my perspective, this is just absurd. Uh, one of the things that we would consider a sort of hallmark of modernity, not modernism, but modernity in animals, was the movement of slaughterhouses outside the city limits. Um, this happened uh, first uh, in Paris and in the arrondissement around Paris, and it's often uh, characterized as a manifestation of housemanization, that the, the things that kept the city going were moved out to the periphery of, of the city to increase urban density. But in my mind, th th this had sort of another underlying reason to it. We didn't want to see what was happening in slaughterhouses. We didn't want to hear, to smell what was going on in these factories of death, because we knew it was wrong. We knew it was wrong. So at least we tried to put it out of our immediate environments. And I've been very disturbed by this sort of regrouping of, of cruelty to sort of micronized environments where it's okay to kill a pig, uh, a chicken, a cow, because we knew how its life was. 
which again, I think is absurd because if there's one thing that we know about the self-activity of biological forms is that they want to be alive. Their, their entire organism is structured around preserving life and making new life. No animal is born with the conscious thought, I'm gonna sacrifice, my, my, my ambition is to sacrifice myself. It's not Westworld, right? Animals don't want to be killed. And, and sort of turning on the animals that we've raised and that we know, I, I actually think it's, it's worse somehow. And so I sort of think of this in my mind as sort of a new cruelty. So how does this uh, relate to art and, and art history? I began looking at the images of, of Franz Marc because I thought that he endeavored to present images that are in my mind at least, objectively pleasing, that valorize the animal. And I would dispute that his work is what we think of as, in the lowercase abstraction, they're abstraction the way that the German modernists meant it and that they're radically simplified, but they're recognizable as, as horses, right? So what brought me to the archeology span museum was studying images of, of cave art. This is an image from um, the Chauvet cave that had not been discovered at the time that Franz Marc lived and made this image of the, the famous image of the term de Blanferde. So I continued to look at these and I'm still, this is what my, my monograph is about. I'm, I'm still uh, working on how this came to be. But the formal concordance between these images and the respect they show for the physical reality, the natural form, as well as the natural behavior of animals is very striking. And there are probably some rational answers which have not yet been recovered for why this is uh, happening. And this is what I'm investigating in my larger project. This is not confined to, to Franz Marc. Here is an image uh, created by Joseph Boyce in 1945, and an image of uh, a reindeer at Alta, which is one I've seen in person. I took this photograph. Uh, Joseph Boyce made his elk uh, many, many years before the animal figures, the rock art at Alta was discovered. So this is my larger research project. I'm not really sure that this will result in much more than uh, a, a book of formal comparisons, but we'll see about that. Um, so shifting radically to uh, an image from contemporary art, I've uh, excised this architectural feature from the place where it resides. And I want to talk about the relationship of contemporary art and hybridization and the representation of animals and why I think this can be uh, the recipient of objective critiques from an animal welfare point of view and from one of aesthetic theory, which I'll get to at the end. So a massive bronze statue of a demoness now adorns the roof of the courthouse of the appellate division of the first department of the Supreme Court of the state of New York. The work of the sculptor Shazaya Sikander and an accompanying figure uh, identical to this one but with a skirt in Madison Square Garden Park um, sorry, consists of unsettling uh, chimerical figures featuring ram's horns and tentacular snake arms but unclosed uh, on this one, apart from uh, the late Supreme Court Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's trademark lace collar. This is a sculptural expression of the age of individuality and hybridization, a symbol of new forms of power and cruelty. Sikander's monstrous bronzes are nonetheless arguably the most interesting public art pieces to appear in some years. They ditch the flat classical references employed by Luciano Garbati's Medusa with the head of Perseus, which 
you may have seen, I'm not gonna show it, a statue of a woman holding a man's severed head that was installed in Lower Manhattan in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein trial. And instead draw on Babylonian, Assyrian, and Akkadian religious iconography, employing notional parts of animals. Specifically, Sikander's figures are versions of the Bernie relief, which many of you have probably seen at the British Museum, the Queen of the Night, uh, believed to represent the goddess Ishtar, or perhaps the earth goddess Ereshkigal. The figure is also the basis for the Hellenic Medusa and uh, the Cretan woman of the snakes, the snake goddess from the Knossos Palace. The story of Perseus's mythical defeat of Medusa is also the story of the Dorian invasion when Mycenaeans replaced the Pelasgian population of Greece and subsumed their Near Eastern beliefs into their Olympic pantheon. We should have invited your colleagues from, from the uh, ancient philosophy department, who I understand you are friends with, to, to, to join us. Ishtar, who had been uh, a goddess, was now demoted to a demon in line with the citizenship-focused mission of Greek religion as a whole. The Olympian gods, unlike their titanic predecessors, were conceptual and representational, as opposed to haptic and sonic. Each of the 12 major deities embodied a distinct, distinct set of ideas, and the mythological stories connecting them expressed conceptual contents and association with animals, the animals now being separated into the roles of mascots and signifiers. Accordingly, the goddess of wisdom was associated with an owl who is often in moral and intellectual conflict with the god of war represented by a horse, both in filial fealty to a father figure who was avatar was an eagle, all of whose plans were sometimes thrown into disarray by the doves pulling the chariot of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. So what is at stake here is a conceptual thesis about the relationship between the mind, the will, technology, and desire, which will ultimately lay the foundations for Greek philosophical thought. In marked contrast, looking at hybridized images, um, as uh, Sabrina Hooke has pointed out in Babylonian and Assyrian religions reconfigured, uh, pioneering Assyriologist Knut Talvquist's standard work, Akadi Shigote from 1938, includes a descriptive list of Akkadian goddesses running more than 240 pages. These goddesses mostly defy all efforts to recover their meanings. To paraphrase Hegel, the secrets of the Assyrians also were secrets for the Assyrians. Their meanings can't be recovered because they depended on specific local political analogies and the elaborate arbitrary system of rules and superstitions they codified. Very similar to the incoherent and somewhat arbitrary ideology that seems to reign over the planet today with regard to both religion and animals. What is the conceptual meaning, for example, of the contemporary deity Ruth Bader Ginsburg, or the modern god of war, Volodymyr Zelensky. Like a voodoo loa, or the ancient Mexican deities, the half-humanoid, half-animal Ishtar is a representation of psychic energy and a cosmos conceived as a contest between, between humans and animals, forces that must be placated as opposed to rationally knowable, harmonious whole in which humans and animals live peacefully together. Her meaning derives from channeling those energies into ceremonial and magical rites, as opposed to philosophical and theological abstractions and physical and material realities available for analysis by the mind. All of this allows us to view Sikander's intervention and similar hybridized contemporary artworks not as seemingly progressive revisions of the concept of justice, for what justice do animals have, but as symbolic regressions to the more primitive force of sacrifice, and specifically the force of the scapegoat mechanism, the Ur ritual underpinning all others. 
as Rene Girard showed, the justice system originally derives from this mechanism of sacrifice and its ritualized forms, but domesticates it by submitting it to higher theoretical, ethical principles. When the neutrality of this system is called into question, the primal impulse to discharge physical and psychic violence through sacrificial propitiation resurfaces from the underworld to wander through the world in search of animal blood. So I've been fascinated by this sort of pretense of new forms of power and their reinterpretation in modern and contemporary art, particularly this image, which is both literal and conceptual and seemingly demands that viewers know something about both the mythology and the art historical tradition from which it is uh, drawn. My students immediately said that they, um, it reminded them of the Venus uh, de Milo and a few people mentioned the more ancient figure of the Willendorfer Venus, but I point, I point out here in this comparison image that the, these, are these two figures are both wholly human, at least as far as we know. This is an interesting side view of the Willendorfer Venus that may uh, reveal how she actually was presented. And as you can see, she does have arms. They're just sort of crossed at her waist. And of course, the Venus de Milo would also have had arms. They're just not present. Um, we're getting to uh, another type of hybridized form. But in wondering about these sort of mythical, magical figures, the other thing that people in our colloquium have mentioned, not the person raising the pig to slaughter, but other people, have been associations with the, the demonic. And the demonic has sort of been drifting back into pop cultural dialogue again. It, it seems to be doing a lot of easy lifting these days, the demonic that is. Uh, they're sort of sifting back into the conversation the way that angels did at the height of the, the pandemic. During the height of the pandemic, of course, angels, for many of us, took the form of, of animals in our pets who we were confined with. And some people, of course, got new pets to sort of ride out the pandemic. And there was an appreciation, again, of the animal world, not just in our domestic space, but I'm sure that you saw many, many of the videos of goats running wild in the streets and dolphins playing in the harbor when uh, air traffic and boat traffic was, was stilled, and car traffic, of course. Um, so this line of appreciating the human with the animal, with the animal separate, even as in a sort of avant-garde form, seems to be a line that's no longer crossed anymore. And this was once a very sort of avant-garde thing. If you think of Dali walking his giant anteater in New York, uh, which may have been sort of uh, homage to the probably fictional uh, Gerard Dernaval's uh, parading of his uh, lobster tubo on a leech. Um, the ram's horns on the Sikander figure are several things in addition to hybridity. Uh, these type of horns are usually typically displayed as trophies. In this case, they're being used as accessories. Uh, there are a simulacra here of great verisimilitude. The desired effect, which seems to be shock and awe maybe, is perhaps not achieved for precisely the reason that the horns look real. And they look real because they can't be real. Um, so in a way, this image, even though it hasn't existed long enough to be reified as kitsch, 
it has already become a sort of pop culture kitsch. And this is a problem for art, for all contemporary art. Um, and to me, this is something that has happened in a slow spiral ever since fashion and art and popular culture were aligned together. Uh, popular culture has been allowed to stand in for and be misunderstood as culture at large, and I'm not sure that is the case. Culture is expected to be mechanistically democratic, which, without being spiritually so, mechanistic democracy being, in actuality, totalitarian and vulgar. I still think, however naively, that the most radical culture involving representations of the animal remains spiritually democratic if I can use those terms rather loosely. I think an added necessity for truly great art in the wake of commodification of even conceptual art is the ability within new art itself to resist the eventual attempts that larger popular culture will make to consume and repurpose it for its own banal ends. Anything that has strength whatsoever, and I don't mean that this issues uh, recognition, but that art now has to maintain its own autonomy rather than to accept autonomy as a given. Economic entrenchment has also a way of monopolizing, and monopolies, once secure, cracked swiftly. Art, thankfully, once the need presents itself, has a way of swimming up and forcing itself through the cracks, though whether or not this ability has been hampered by current cultural and economic conditions remains to be seen. I disagree with the idea of art being the ro most refined and truest indicator of the human. I was thinking of the scene in Dune where the Reverend Mother admits, administers her gomjabar and says that an animal would have chewed off its own leg to escape a trap like that rather than endure the torture. I like to imagine in more fanciful moments that this is a sort of challenge and the reward art has to look forward to in the face of things like AI, chat GPT, and whatever, has, whatever technology has in store for us and the time that remains. Um, I'm showing an, what is a, a hybrid uh, form right now, but one that uh, struck me in such a way that I didn't easily dismiss it. And in fact, I was quite engaged with this, and this is the artist Tanya Thoryusen, who has uh, undertaken the challenge to participate with us at the Archaeologist Museum, showing her drawings and making new objects with Archaeology Museum's own objects, uh, which she calls uh, tupelax. Um, I found in Tanya's work, uh, in the Tupelac series, uh, a type of artwork that rejected the sort of algorithmization of the soul. Um, not to disparage the beautiful artifact in the archaeology museum, but um, I felt that Tanya's work was produced and considered without the notion of the goal of what things are used for. In other words, it seemed to reclaim a little bit art for itself and also to use even the hybridized form of the animal in um, an aesthetically pleasing and balanced manner. So in this form, drawing, this very fine style of rendering, and painting are, are blessed crutches, an activity ultimately naive that one can take however far or however clever or stupid as one likes with it, like right, any one of us can, can draw, kind of, not, not like this, but I mean, it's, 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 it's democratic in nature. And in that way, uh, if you're just doodling a picture of an animal to yourself. I mean, when, when I doodle, I find that I often draw 
animals, not really automatic drawing, but you probably do the same, fish, cat ears, rabbits, shark fins. Um, and then th this, this seems to push back against even our own willful desire to commodify, whether fully cognizant or blithefully unaware of the cost. Um, How am I on, on time? <laughs> well, then let's, uh, let's bust through these images and I'll, I'll sort of get to the end here because I would like to have as much time as possible to... Um, this, uh, this image, uh, Nanuk Paulinia, uh, is uh, something that Tanya was working on earlier. And I asked her if we could return to these and display them. As you can see, we have some mammals here who are uh, native to the Arctic, uh, walrus, a polar bear, and uh, a seal. And my reception of this artwork was that these animals were huddled together uh, and sort of clinging uh, in desperation on a final patch of ice. And yet it is a, a dignified image. They are individual animals. Um, they are, their eyes are open. They're bodily interacting with each other. They are sentient and aware of what is, is happening, but they are not Bathetic. So it is us to us then, the viewer, who falls the task of, of mourning and thinking about the individual fates of the animals. Um, and this, I think, to fully absorb what is happening in the sixth mass extinction requires this level of confronting, uh, of mourning, of, of, real, of real sadness, um, grieving for, for what we have, have done to, to the animals, for what we have done to the, the planet. And this, of course, requires us to accept our own mortality. Uh, the generation immediately before ours uh, some of you probably have elderly parents or grandparents, um, sim simply had a refusal to look death and decline in the face, um, a resistance to measures that might ease things for themselves and for future generations. So, I'm trying to sort of synthesize all of these ideas and kind of like you might expect, I return to German aesthetic and philosophical art historical theory. My main concern, of course, is the representation of animals across time. And when I look at depictions of mammoths, aurochs, rhinos in cave art and Franz Marx's drawings, paintings, and particularly renderings of the sentient living animal, I see them in the environment where these images were conceived and developed, an environment that psychologically has remained pristine and unchanged. In the cave art, the cave acts as a frame that effectively isolates and protects animals from the outside world of today. The reality, though, is that these animals who were delicately painted on rock surfaces disappeared from Europe millennia ago. When I look at the Franz Marc work, which here shows us something that we could not see in a photograph or we could not have seen it in a photograph at the time that Franz Marc was alive, which is the activity of the cats, which I think you will realize is very dynamic and kind of captures the uh, physiology of cats and the mouse into whom we might project ourselves. But we also see something that a photograph could not show us, which is the cat gestating kittens. Um, so this to me is uh, 
a work of great imagination that calls for us to project into the, 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 the canvas itself. Uh, this methodological approach is an extrapolation from the writings of Hal Foster on Noctraglicite, whose book I showed. Oops, I knew that would happen. I uh, highly recommend it. Um, Foster has advanced uh, an alternative historical critical model of deferred action in which the historical and epistemological significance of avant-garde artists are never fulfilled or apprehended in the first instance, nor ever can they be, as for Foster, the avant-garde is registered as a form of trauma, which is how I'm registering animal death and the sixth death extinction, a whole and the symbolic order of history. While the historical avant-garde grappled to work through the traumas of modernity, further and future iterations respond to and attempt to work through the deferred trauma of this initial coming to terms. No longer an evolutionary avant-garde of historical pro progress, we replace dialectical sublation with notraglicite and the past and future tenses of continuity and rupture with the future of the will have been. This, this system of affirmative recovery can be used to assail and to change the socio-psychological barriers of how humans relate to animals. A return to the particular in animal portraiture is necessary also to confront obstacles of instrumental reason. German aesthetics theory aids in such recovery because it introduces Einfühlung, empathy, as a cognitive model that proves capable of conveying such particularity. The separation of scientific and artistic modes of knowledge production are not yet decided, and the idea of the sentiency of animals is still being controversially negotiated and expressed. Thank you. <laughs>